All right, everyone. I am here with longtime friend of the show, John Bohannon, who is director of science at Primer AI. Uh, if you recognize John's name, it may be from his May 2018 interview or his appearance in our Twimmel Fest office hours, which were focused on NLP back in October of last year. John, it is so great to have you back on the show. Welcome. Great to be back. I'm really looking forward to digging into our conversation. This is part of our uh, AI Rewind 2021 series, and you are going to help us review all of the uh, amazing things that happened in the NLP sphere this past year. Yeah, I, I first of all, this has been so fun over the past uh, week. I've been preparing for this. Um, I don't think anyone's keeping up with everything in NLP. It's just, it's, <laughs> it's just so much happening. So I really had to dig in, talk to my team, really review. And so I've learned a ton. Um, the big picture that emerged for me, at least, was two things. One is that what we used to call NLP, you know, just text. Text in, stuff comes out, uh, but nothing else. Um, that seems to be chilling out. That, like... For the past few years, um, it didn't seem like a month would go by without some huge revolution, you know, some brand new architecture, some totally new way of you know, dealing with the data. And now that's kind of like flattening out. And we're in what I think you can call the incremental phase of the science. So the big explosion, and now it's just like heads down, trying to make it more efficient, you know, just better. Um, and then the second big theme that emerged for me was that NLP is kind of like eating up the rest of ML. You know, uh -huh. they, they used to, they used to say like uh, software is eating the world, and then and it was ML is eating software. software. Yep. Now yeah. I think NLP <laughs> is eating ML uh, because computer vision and, and language are just coming together. So there's, I think that was the the most like freakishly new, really cool stuff. The rest is just like get into business, making it yeah. work. Yeah, that's awesome. And in fact, that theme was uh, the the core, that latter of the two themes that you mentioned was kind of the core of the conversation in our computer vision episode in the AI Rewind series. Um, I think we'll talk about it from, well, you know, obviously a slightly different take uh, in this conversation, but so far the consensus is that uh, that has absolutely been the case. Um, Let's maybe dive into that uh, particular point. What were some of the specific uh, things that you saw that kind of led to this feeling of NLP eating the world? So, I mean, it was right in January of this year that Dolly came out. Um, OpenAI is just crushing it. OpenAI, OpenAI is just <laughs> owning this weird new hybrid space. Uh, and they're clearly having a blast. I mean, you, you you almost giggle while you read their papers. You can just tell how fun it is to do this new work. I mean, it's, it's you know, we were talking earlier about how hard it is to keep up with the space, but it's hard to keep up with just open AI. <laughs> I know. I know. It's, God, it's just a really exciting time. So, you know, Dolly was followed by Clip. And most recently, we have this new thing called Glide. Mm -hmm. uh, that just came out, like, in the recent, like, past week or two. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually played with it this morning and I emailed you uh, some of the output. I was just playing with it this morning. Um, it's, it's just getting so dang good. Uh, you, you just literally use language to ask a model to generate images that you want. And um, one way that we've been using it, you can actually um, make it do useful work too. You can do image search. So uh, if you've got a whole bunch of images, uh, let's say that you harvested from Twitter or something, and you want to say, hey, find me, blah. And you just describe it. Like, write the caption for an image you think exists. So you just take all those images and you put them into this embedding space that lives in the same world as the text. And so it takes your text, it finds that high dimensional address, and then it just goes finds images that are kind of in that neighborhood and shows it to you. So like semantic search on images is suddenly really, really working. So that's just cool. Maybe contextualize Glide relative to Dolly and Clip. What are the, the differences between the, the three? Yeah, so Dolly generates images. Clip is this uh, classifier. That, that's the thing that uh, knows how to take captions and images. That's the training data originally. 
and put them into a common high dimensional space so that you can go from text to image or image to text. Um, and so Glide is a new innovation where rather than guiding the generator of the images to try and satisfy the caption you gave it um, with a classifier, it uses a noising technique so that you actually don't even need the classifier. And the result, which I sh I'm, I'm pretty convinced by even sh sending you those low res images, is that it's much better at making photorealistic images. You know, like up till now, most of the fun that people have been having with um, uh, VQGAN and Clip, Clip Systems, has been like dreamy stuff. Like, you know, you, something crazy. Like uh, I did a whole holiday themed one um, at Primer where I was just doing variations on Christmas trees. And one of them was um, a Christmas tree gr uh, growing in a bathroom. And sure enough, it created this surreal image of a Christmas tree growing out of a toilet with a kind of a hand towel <laughs> looking like a Santa hat, you know, just like <laughs> you're, you're not going to, you're not going to like make anything useful for the world, but it's fun. Um, yeah. But with Glide, um, they're getting so good that um, I think it actually will actually get commercial use. And the really cool innovation is in painting. So now you can use this system to make an image. Let's say you're a designer and you want to make uh, like a mock-up of a, a living room or a landscape or whatever it is you, you're trying to like visualize. And so you describe it and then you want to change something about it. What you can do is literally like finger paint, you can kind of circle a little zone of the image and then you can add an element. You could be like, and a red barn. Uh, and then you could go in on that red barn. You'd be like with yellow windows. Uh, so it's, this is the future of Photoshop. There will be a language interface to Photoshop. Either Adobe's going to do that or someone's going to eat their lunch. But that, that's, that's what we're going to be using in the future. And so is Glide using Clip to... No, you don't need it. That's the whole point. Own... You don't need it anymore. Okay. Yeah. So... It's pretty cool. And they haven't released the full uh, weights model, but they released a small version, which is what I used this morning to send you the uh, Corgi in a robot costume and robot uh, for giant friendly robot visiting St. Louis. Nice. And those images are, uh, we, you were just mentioning this, but they're generated images based on the text as opposed to the way you originally described it. It was almost like an image search where it's finding the images. What's the relationship? Between well, so the old, the old way, you still need a, a generator that knows how to take text and try and generate an image. Um, but the way they used to in the back, in, in the, like, I think like from now on, we're not going to be using Clip to guide that generation. So it starts off with just a random, you know, bunch of pixels. And then it, try, it tries to move in the direction of an image that matches your caption because there's that common space. So Clip was doing all that guidance before. Now with Glide, you don't need Clip to do that. So that's that's the idea. And it's pretty it's pretty fast too. I mean, even though they're not very high res, it was like a minute per image uh, this morning to make those. So I could just play around. That's awesome. That's awesome. And along the same lines, you mentioned uh, a few other models and papers that uh, were in similar vein. What were some of those? Yeah, so on the theme of NLP eating the world, um, papers uh, and you know usable systems have started to emerge in chemistry, um, in like medicine, and and I think it's just going to keep on going. The general utility of the transformer architecture and the approach of you know like feeding in the, you know data in the in a similar way that we teach um, these models in an unsupervised fashion, language is just starting to pay off. So we've seen protein uh, structure prediction. We've seen uh, chemical uh, formula, um, you know, like manipulation. Um, I think it'll just keep on going. We're going to just keep, it's like a little acid that's eating through problem space. And I, you know, I don't know where it'll stop, but I, I also don't think it's going to stop with these things that are like clip and glide. There's no, there's nothing special about images other than we just happen to have a whole bunch of data. We have a whole bunch of images with captions. That's super convenient. But I think like what's coming next, of course, is video. Um, and, you know, with robotics, you've got other senses. What about tactile? What about movement? You know, I think that 
the uh, the trend is going to be towards multimodality with a single system. So you'll have you'll be able to just like describe things in text or show like a video example of what you're trying to get at or a sketch. You can come in from any angle and there will be this massive common embedding space for all modalities. I think that's that's probably where we're headed. Yeah, in a lot of ways this is uh you know we're we're approaching this world that uh NLP folks have been evangelizing for a while in the sense of you know, we, we, we create language around all these concepts that we care about. Uh, and so NLP, you know, is a, a fundamental currency of thought, right? Um, and so the NLP community has been arguing that, you know, all the work in that field is going to pay off because uh, that's the way we, you know, we think. We think using language, we communicate using language. Uh, and so, whereas before computer vision was in isolation, um, you know, that wasn't grounded by language. Uh, and so now we, you know, we're starting to bring it all together and what you're saying is we're just getting started. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This is just like the very beginning. Um, a lot of people are saying that video is coming this year. I don't think so. I think, uh, that's really hard. I think, uh, it's going to be a little while before we have a clip or glide equivalent for video. Uh, but I'm, what I'm waiting for is that first moment, kind of like, uh, you know, like the very first moments of uh, audio recording when you get that first hello world moment. A hello world moment for um, computer generated video, you know, like GAN style generated yeah. video um, will probably be a, like a little cartoon animation, like an animated GIF. I don't know why has anyone hasn't done it yet, but you know, there's just coming that Giphy. But what's the closest you've seen? I haven't seen a thing. Uh, the closest I've seen is you take a real video and then you basically apply, um, you know, something like Style transfer kind of thing. Or... Yeah. You, you basically take frame by frame and you just transform it. So I, you can find yeah. Reddit just flooded with these cute short clips of real video that have been transformed into mm -hmm. weird things. But um, I mean, we're sitting on a gold mine of, of data called Giphy. Mm -hmm. I, it's just someone's got to be doing that right now. Just take yeah. that data set and make a version of clip for Giphy mm -hmm. so that we can have animated GIFs on demand. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's going to be the hello world. And from there, you know, it's onwards to Hollywood. Yeah, you mentioned the work that's happened in proteins and chemistry and, and medicine. What's the what's kind of the common theme behind uh, these papers? What are they trying to do? It's, it really all boils down to the original trick of the transformer. Um, it's, it's, it's amazing how valuable that idea was, you know, a paper in 2017 has just completely taken over the world. Um, you know, the idea is if you have a sequence of some kind language, um, it could be pixels, it could be sound, could be uh, DNA or protein sequences. Um, you just, you make the, what we call a language model in NLP. It'll probably, maybe it'll always be called language model, even when it's not language. Um, I, I see that in papers. Like I linked two papers in what I sent you. One's called a protein language model. Um, so maybe that'll be the trend. You just call that a language model, even if it's not human language. But the idea is you just, um, you teach the system to learn the patterns in the data by having it self-supervise at a massive scale is just essentially doing, you know, we call it tokens by tokens. You just take this attention window, you stick it in there. And the usual trick is you do a mass token task where you hide some of those tokens and you teach it to fill them in or autoregressive. You cut it and you say, what would you, you know, continue writing from here? It's all amounting to the same thing. You're forcing this very, very massive function. That's all a neural network is. It's just a huge function with a like ridiculous number of variables that we call parameters to, you know, essentially satisfy this objective of being able to predict. And the weird thing is all of these cool skills just seem to emerge from that. I think dumb trick. I, I think of it as a, and that's not a pejorative. I think it's a beautiful dumb trick. And, uh, that's another theme, by the way, I, we still don't know, understand. We don't understand how it works which blows my mind. <laughs> ML used to be a branch of math. 
Now it feels more like biology. It feels like we're studying things that we don't fully understand and we're just taking an empirical approach, probing and prodding, trying to figure out how they work. Do you follow the more theoretical side of NLP and the efforts that are taking place to try to better understand uh, how the models are working? The extent of my engagement with that, you're, full honesty, it, full honesty is uh, here at Primer, we have a Slack channel uh, called Algorithms, just for historical reasons. And people drop papers in there and start discussions. And uh, every once in a while, I will see something that a theoretical paper that just seems to be making some bold claim. Usually it's like, sounds like physics to me. And I'll just tag tag in people, usually people with a physics, physics background who are on my team and say, please explain this. Is this a big deal? <laughs> and so we like dig into it. And um, usually the consensus is maybe. <laughs> Even even people on my team who like can really come to grips with with these theoretical papers are are always like, well, let's see. Like it, it feels very nascent. There hasn't been any big like reduction, un, reductive understanding that you would get in like physics with these models. It's still very empirical. When, and when people take a theoretical take, it's like intriguing. But I'm just you know like. I'm just waiting for someone to say, oh yeah, this is the breakthrough we've been waiting for. This explains a lot. And I just haven't heard that. Yeah, kind of along those lines, one comment that was recently made to me relating to NeurIPS was this feeling that the, the NeurIPS, and let me be clear, an individual's experience with NeurIPS was that, um, you know, they're, they were able to take less practical, uh, practical, they, they got less out of it, I guess is the, the only way to say it. And, uh, I was reflecting on that and this idea that, you know, over the past few years, what, one of the things that's been really interesting about this field is that you to, to, to stay on top of the field and to implement, you know, useful things that were beyond something that was already packaged in a, in a, in a library. Like you, you had to read papers to understand what folks were doing um, because the field was evolving so quickly. And um, I think you kind of alluded to this in your opening and that the field is in some sense slowing down and, I wonder if there's a corollary to that, that the kind of the hardcore research is, you know, is diverging from practice more so than in the past. Yeah, I agree. Does that and resonate I, at all? It does resonate and, and it manifests in a bunch of different ways. Um, one of them, here's a really practical way that this manifests. Um, early on, and by early, I mean like circa 2018. <laughs> Um, NLP, you know, modern NLP is so new. Um, these benchmarks emerged, you know, it was like, okay, let's get down to business people. Uh, we need, you know, natural language processing needs to take the, you know, measurement of these models seriously. Cause we started to create these giant language models that had these amazing capabilities and everyone wanted to play the game of, uh, is my model better than yours? And so, you know, you had glue. And then that got beaten. We had super glue. Now we have something called gem and there's like a whole zoo of benchmarks out there. And something I've noticed is that they are just less and less useful. Um, I, I, I think of them as academic benchmarks, academic uh, data sets. So what you do is you, you know, you take, if you want to know how good named entity recognition is one of the, like the old school core tasks of NLP find me the people, places, things in this text. Um, there's this old data set floating around called ConLL. Uh, it's really old. It's uh, just a little sample of news, um, you know, just from, I think, like one source um, from one period of time. And we've been using it ever since to measure how good you are at, at you know, NER. And um, it wasn't that long before, you know, when we built our own NER model, we started to notice that performance on that benchmark, that academic Connell benchmark, started to drift away from the performance on real customer data that we've gold labeled that we cared about. And that was the trend that we just saw happening over and over again is that 
it does, you know, if you're chasing state of the art on these, on these big benchmarks, you're actually often driving down the performance on something you care about. And so you have to make your own internal benchmarks. And I think we're not alone. I think everyone across the industry is quietly maintaining their own internal benchmarks to keep track of stuff. And that's bad, right? This, that's, this was that, a theme that came up in the computer vision conversation. Also, we, we've, we're focused on the flip side of that, which was the academic tendency, at least in CV to, you know, quote unquote, overfit on ImageNet. Yeah. Right? Um, and you're describing the, you know, you, you know, the flip side of yours would be overfit on blue or glue or whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Um, so but, I mean, that's one of the manifestations though, of this problem is right. that, you know, early on when NLP just started to explode, you know, a big conference like NeurIPS, um, you know, and, and these kind of shared resources, like these benchmarks made sense. Like we didn't, we didn't even have a map. We didn't have a compass. We were just, okay, let's get together, figure something out. Yeah. Now we're past the explosion and we're in the like settling, like stable phase of the science where it's like, okay, let's make it good. Let's make it efficient. And now it's like very applied now, like the performance of some base language model on some, you know, completely kooky task, like natural language inference, um, it's kind of beside the point. That's like not even helpful anymore. So yeah, no one solved this, but that's a, that's a big story of this year is like turmoil over benchmarks, how to measure the performance, what's relevant, how to improve things. Um, and all the big companies came out with their own new big approach to this. The only thing that I've seen this year, that's a truly new take on this is something from Facebook, uh, meta called uh, Dynabench. And that's an experiment that's running now. So there, rather than just have a frozen gold label set and, you know, like a test and everyone takes the same test, uh, it's an ever evolving test that's adversarial. The whole point is to have humans in the loop try and trick models. And so you're collecting all these adversarial examples that models find really difficult. And so it's just constantly evolving. And as a side, virtuous side benefit, you're generating all this useful truly instructive adversarial data. So that's that's a really fresh take. I'm going to be really interested this year to see what results come out of that. That That is really interesting. Do you, kind of on this uh, benchmark, th this idea that in industry, folks are collecting their own benchmark data sets, do you, do you see that changing in the sense that of, you know, industry consortia or groups of organizations kind of sharing uh, this information to try, to try to create better data sets, or is it more, uh, you know, either some combination of, you know, this is our proprietary advantage. And so, you know, we're going to keep it or it's, you know, it's really only relevant to us anyway, because it's, you know, our specific problem, our specific customers, that kind of thing. No, I, I don't, I don't think there's a lot of goodwill, uh, around in this space anymore. <laughs> I, the trend I'm seeing is use benchmarks to be able to brag about achieving state of the art, even if it's not really relevant and, um, quietly curating your own high value data that actually gets you models that solve the problems that people pay money for. Um, the big, the big like exception to this, that's going against that tide is Ellie Uther. If that's how you pronounce it, I've never actually never heard that name. The creators of the GPT three alternative, the GPT Neo folks. So, um, I love that they're out there open sourcing nonstop. They put out a huge data set called the pile. They put out GPT Neo. And I think, you know, they're, they're a force for, for good going against the tide of, um, basically, uh, closed, closed ML development. Cause the problem is like, that's going to slow down the science. That's the beauty of shared resources and standards is like, we can all march to the same drum beat and make progress more quickly, but there's just a lot of money to be made right now. I mean, NLP is where all the investment's going. So you're going to see a lot of, a lot of, uh, anti-scientific trends. Along those lines, are you seeing a decrease in, uh, publishing by, you know, corporate research teams? No, I haven't seen any trend like that. They're still publishing, uh, you know, solder chasing papers. Oh, we got uh -huh. to the art on this. We got to the art. <laughs> Um, even when it's just crazy, I mean, in, um, in, you know, a lot of, uh, NLP, they're still using this, this standard called Rouge. So it was invented for, um, you know, machine translation. Now it's used to evaluate summary quality. 
Um, and then everyone just openly knows that it's completely flawed, but people just keep on reporting st- state of the art results, you know, with the Rouge metric, even though we have alternatives now, but it just reveals that a lot of the publishing that's happening, whether it's in universities or big companies is really just bragging rights. Yeah. Rather than true scientific sharing. I mean, there's a mixture. There's a lot of, there's a lot of goodwill still, but yeah, it's a troubling trend. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, so maybe going back to this idea of incremental progress within NLP, um, you know, it sounds bad, but you know, when you think about kind of the hype cycle and you know the way markets, I evolve, think it's beautiful. It, it sounds less exciting, less sexy than NLP eating the world. But um, I, you know, I think we're saying the same thing here. It's a it's a necessary phase, and it's where. Um, you know, we talk, we throw around this idea of democratization and stuff like that. It's hard. And this is related to the point I was making about, you know, everyone needing to be a researcher to use NLP. Like it's not the case anymore because things are settling down. The tools are standardizing. Like you can pull state of the art stuff off of hugging face and, you know, just use it. You don't have to implement the paper. Yeah, exactly. I I think it's great. Um, I mean, that's the business I'm in, you know, like we're trying to build stuff that people pay money for. So you got to make that stuff efficient and actually high performance. So yeah, it's just settling down into normal science, normal engineering. Um, but the, the revolution is still ongoing, you know, it's just that this first big, you know, explosion, uh, that was made possible by transformer based language models. Um, it's kind of cooling down. It's like a, a lot of alternatives to transformers have been proposed. There was a paper, you know, you can forget transformers. You can use Fourier transform forget this, you can use this, you know, and uh, none of them seem to have taken off. Transformer seems to be here to stay. And so what are you seeing in the dimension of uh, improving efficiency? Well, the really exciting thing is um, it started with something called the switch transformer uh, that Google implemented successfully. Apparently the idea is a lot older. I didn't realize that. But um, in a nutshell, rather than having one gigundo neural net, where when you feed in something at the bottom, it has to do pachinko through the whole network to get your answer out the other side. You instead fragment it into what's called a mixture of experts. So bunches of little neural networks. And then you have something at the bottom that does the routing. So when a little piece of information comes in, like language token or whatever, it gets routed to the right expert. Sometimes these systems route it to a couple experts and let them kind of uh, duke it out. But the point is you can have a gigantic system that's very sparsely activated. So it's way cheaper to train, way cheaper to uh, do inference on. And you can do it uh, with distributed architecture very naturally. Whereas if you have your whole neural network that needs to be in memory, maybe even on a chip, you know, there's a hard limit to how big you can make these things. Um, the size, the parameter size of these models has been outstripping Moore's law by a healthy, healthy helping uh, over the past few years. And that's got people worried. You know, money, power consumption, climate change impact, um, a f- only a few giant companies being able to even operate with these things. So the switch transformer has been a, a really exciting development this year. And uh, two models, one from DeepMind, one from Google, um, came out just recently, Gopher and Glam. Um, Glam's been around a little longer. Um that implement it. And also there's a, a really amazing result from Facebook AI. Um, they go by Facebook AI or meta AI now, I guess it's meta AI then, um, where they, uh, had a multilingual translation model that beat all of the bilingual models for the first time on the big WMT annual machine translation contest. Uh, so it used this, uh, mixture of experts architecture. So it ran a lot more efficiently. So that that idea seems to be taken off, uh, and I can I can expect that this year it'll just keep going, and maybe eventually we'll we'll say goodbye to uh, single neural network, you know, systems. Is there anything special required at the infrastructure hardware? Oh, for lower sure. Level to- for sure, and that will come. <laughs> <laughs> we'll we'll get you know the pie torch for distributed you know mixture of expert transformers in due uh-huh. time I'm sure, yeah. Um, but yeah, for now it's pretty bespoke. I, I think you need a, 
a real team of experts to implement this. Got it. Got but it, got it. can't be long before, you know, tools get good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, I, I think it's the same process that we've been talking about. We've, you know, there's a, an innovation in the switch transformer. It's kind of standardized and demonstrated to be effective across, or at least from several different groups. And, you know, now the PyTorch community and others can, you know, take it and kind of push it down into their level and um, take advantage of it. What are you seeing around um, kind of building operational pipelines around transformers or transformers in production, that kind of thing? Um, you know, this relates somewhat to the the broader problem or your know, challenges around like fairness and um, and predictability of language models and and uh, you know, ethics, that, that kind of thing. I'm thinking about the, the guardrails that an organization needs to put in place around large language models if they're productizing them, uh, but also the kind of MLOps processes um, that are required to operationalize them. Are, are, they, are they diverging from any other kind of model um, or um, are they you know, you're seeing the same practices applied to transformers. Well, this, this touches on a pretty rich vein. We could take this from a lot of different angles. Um, there's the whole issue of, um, ML ethics and responsible ML. Um, and that, that's been a sea change over this past year. Um, and that really is starting to have really practical effects on, on, as you say, ML ops, like how do you actually operationalize this stuff? Um, uh, protecting against harm, increasing the, you know, the quality of data by accounting for, um, things like bias and toxic language. So all of that is happening. There's also a kind of more boring side of this, which is just how do you make these systems cheaper to, you know, cost to serve, drive down cost to serve, make it more data efficient to train these models. And there's a whole bunch of new tricks that are emerging on that side too. So there's like, the side of spicy, spicy side and the mild side, which, which, which do you want to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let's start with the, the mild side. Um, and we'll get to the, the spicy side. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. So for the mild appetizer, um, one thing that's emerging is, um, all kinds of clever tricks for increasing data efficiency. So when I say data efficiency, I mean like how many training examples did you need to get your model to some target performance. So, you know, you have some target in mind, how long did it take you to get there? And uh, the whole trend has been that that number is getting lower and lower and lower. And the most exciting thing over the past year has been uh, few shot learning. So um, when GPT-2 and GPT-3 came out, people started using the phrase few shot learning and zero shot learning um, erroneously. So- yeah. <laughs> it's like really confusing because you know when you when you do prompt engineering and you and you it's write like this really clever part. prompt, there's no learning <laughs> happening here. Right. You, you've just changed the format of the input. Yeah. But um, true few shot learning has started to actually emerge. So all kinds of really clever tricks for driving down that um, cost in terms of data to get some performance measurement. One here, here's one of the like really cute tricks. So when you want to make a classifier. So mm -hmm. document comes in and you tell me whether it belongs in bucket A, B, or C. Yeah. You know, this is like NLP task 101. Um, usually what we do old school is you give it a whole bunch of label data. And the first thing the model has to do during training is figure out what the task even is. You don't give it instructions. Mm -hmm. You just punish it every time it gives a wrong answer. And so the whole beginning of the, of the training is just figuring out what the task is. And that's not efficient. You know, that's like administering a test to students where you don't even tell them what's going on, you know, and they just have to kind of figure out what it is first. Mm -hmm. um, and so one of the cute tricks I've seen emerge is just make it multiple choice. Just mm -hmm. literally spell it out right there in the in the input data, what the possible choices are. It's just like such a nice, simple trick. And that's what I mean when it comes to incremental science. You know, it's like mm -hmm. bunches and bunches of little artisanal advantage, you know, uh, improvements to how we do things that's squeezing out efficiency and performance. And, and that, is that an example 
and is your broader point related to you've already got a trained large language model and you're trying to figure out the, you know, basically how to get it to do what you want? Yep. It's just old fashioned, now old fashioned fine tuning of a language model. The same old, same old. Another neat trick that's emerged is um, the pipelines themselves. So this is something we've been grappling with at Primer. Um, you know, if you're just uh, some person at home wanting to do a little batch of data using some hugging face model, you don't worry too much about the cost. It's just sort of a quick one-off. It's no big deal. But if you need to do millions of documents with, let's say, dozens of different machine learning models for a customer, and you, you're on the hook for the cost to serve, it really matters. You, you look yeah. at your monthly AWS bill and you're shocked. So, you know, there's a lot of motivation out there to try and figure out how do we drive down the cost to serve of these systems once we scale it. And so one of the things that um, you can do, and this is borrowed so true of, of NLP these days, take an old concept from like computer vision and just figure out how to reapply it. So it's the idea of model cascades. That's what they call it over in um, computer vision. Rather than just have your big, great model doing all the work, you have a cascade of models maybe sort of like not that good, better, better, best. Uh, and you basically do what I call inference triage. So what we found, and we're about to publish a paper on this, is you can, with some really expensive uh, classification tasks, you can have a old school scikit-learn CPU driven, no GPUs needed model do 99% of the work. And all it has to learn how to do is take the ambiguous tricky cases and pass those on to the the big model. Yeah. It's stuff like that. Just like really yeah. simple tricks. That's, that's what engineering evolution looks like. Just mm -hmm. an accumulation of tricks. Yeah. I mean, it, it, you know, I guess all the best tricks sound obvious once you say them, right? <laughs> yeah. Although I got to say transformers, that's clever. Yeah. It's still such a cool <laughs> idea. It's to me, it's never going to feel obvious. That's just such a cool idea. Yeah. Language models, even like cool yeah. idea. So that's the mild side. So um, let's talk about the uh, the evolution of the way we're thinking about uh, ethics and responsibility in the context of NLP. What, what are you seeing there? Well, I'll start by making a prediction for 2022, since we're supposed to be doing some of those, right? We're going to do some of those. Yeah, absolutely. All right. I'm going to throw one, up, throw one in. Um, I don't think that Amazon Alexa or Apple Siri or Google Assistant are going to get dramatically better this year, even though they could. And... I think it's because they are, these companies are rightly cautious about the language models that would power that. Um, we're just not, it just doesn't feel safe enough yet. It just takes one really, really egregious, you know, public relations disaster to nuke the whole effort. And I think they're going to hold back until that stuff is all ironed out. So I don't think you're going to, even though like you're going to have hugging face models and maybe little startup, you know, efforts that are, feel like they're miles ahead uh, in some regards with human interaction, whether it's speech or text or just making sense of things. Um, I think that the big companies are going to lay low a lot longer. So that's my prediction and okay. I, and, and rightly so. Okay. Um, so on the spicy side, um, in retrospect, this, no one should have been surprised by any of this. Like what are these models? They're just big mathematical objects trained on data. Where'd that data come from? Us. It's our written text on the internet mostly. Where did that come from? Well, a very biased point of view. A very, very biased point of view. English speaking almost entirely, Western, industrialized, male dominated. And, you know, it comes from a human history that is only now starting to, you know, on the time scale of human history kind of yesterday, woke up to equality. And um, so it shouldn't have surprised anyone that if you put a language model um, behind a free form interface where you can just like talk to it or make it say stuff, that you can very easily make it say things that are uh, just like politically unacceptable and sometimes ethically shocking. And yet the past year, I mean, really it started the year before, but it continued this year people just keep on stepping in that landmine. Um, the, the one that I noticed this year was um, the Allen Institute for uh, Artificial Intelligence made this cute little 
cute little experiment called Delphi. Mm -hmm. You remember this? Yep. And man, that blew up in their face. Um, and you know, the, the, I don't think it was a mistake to do the science. It was a cool question. Could you, if you made a big data set of ethical statements, you know, things that are right and wrong, could you generalize at all? Could you get a model to like take statements as input and say whether it's like sounds ethically right or wrong? Interesting idea. It's like basically a toy experiment. And the one mistake they made was they put it online in a way that allowed anyone to say anything to this model. And of course, if you're motivated, you want to make the model say something racist, it, it'll take you like 15 seconds. And then they, you know, this is the part I don't like. Then they absolutely mob bullied the, you know, these poor scientists who had good intentions. Come on, like they weren't out to harm anyone. And so that's the trend we've been seeing is just sort of people making these self-inflicted <laughs> mistakes using language models and, you know, like Twitter beating up on them. And uh, I mean, there was a time when we talked, when it came to machine learning and ethics, we talked about systems that were deployed in the world, like things that determined parole, things that determined whether you got hired or not, that were having impacts today. And people were truly being harmed and like those, you know, facial recognition systems being used, you know, to, you know, like hassle people that clearly had racial bias. Suddenly that whole conversation moved to, can you make a language model say something racist? And like, so what's come of that? Some very good things. It's a complete shift. I think there are still people that are. There are, on. there are, but like it has made a lot of heat and noise. And I think some good things are finally coming out of this. One is that you, you can't not talk about the ethics of your work anymore. Mm -hmm. Like, Papers, uh, you know, routinely will have an ethics section. It's just expected now. Um, when you dream up some project, you're not going to be able to avoid the conversation, hopefully before you even get started of like, well, what, what are the possible harms? That's a sea change that, you know, just a couple of years ago that that just wasn't the case. And I think that's the biggest positive impact of all this um, is that we're talking about it. And then the second one is um, people are starting to get practical about it. Uh, DeepMind, I saw, put out um, a blog post describing practical ways that they try and uh, reduce these kind of biases in data and uh, also ameliorate like the impact on the other side. So we're just starting to get really practical. One of the really cool results from the recent um, Glam and Gopher papers, I can't remember which one, but one of the two of them, um, they claimed that they got a lot of bang for buck by actually practically addressing the problem of data quality. So they had all kinds of clever filters on huge gobs of internet data to try and get rid of some of the worst stuff like, you know, internet chat and um, uh, toxic language. You know, they pre-filtered that out and, and they got better performance on the task that they cared about. Practical. So it's, it's not just, it's not just um, a bunch of heat and noise. It's, it's actually productive. Mm -hmm. I don't think I saw the DeepMind paper that you referred to. I have to get that link from you. Um, I think you, you're 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 touching on the the medium spicy that 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 uh, I was referring to earlier, and the example that comes to mind for me was this. Um, it was a tweet from a while back. If uh, this was in October, end of October. Uh, someone did a search on Google about, you know, what should you do when someone's having a seizure and you know how it has the, the, the featured snippets, um, the featured snippets basically gave us some bullet points, which if you get, went to the text of the page that it was referring to were the things not to do. Oh dear. So I wrote a little piece about that and kind of talked generally about the need for governance and the you know, we're starting to see more kind of model monitoring and governance tools. Um, but I wanted to get your take, you know, for an organization that's putting these models out into the wild, like what are the, the tools and processes that you're using to try to constrain their behavior? Like, you know, one is just don't put them, don't put them up. Um, another is, you know, we see, um, 
you know, we've seen with Google, like they'll put like, uh, they'll filter, like you can't, you know, search this, ter- you can't use some set of search terms because it knows the model breaks under those searches. So it'll, you know, create lists of um, filtered terms. You know, that's one thing I'm curious what, you know, what are the other things that you're seeing folks doing um, in the kind of the full spectrum of, you know, sophistication, you know, or is it just kind of a, you know, an exclusion list up front kind of, well, I can, sophistication we're at. I can tell you as an outsider to this because, you know, where I am primer primer is working with big, a small number of very big customers. And so the relationship we have, when we deploy models, we can talk directly to the very small manageable number of people who actually need it. And so there's a trusting relationship there that's very dynamic. We can you know, fix problems as we occur them. So in a certain sense, we can be um, a little less, I guess you could say just less cautious, but you don't need to be as cautious. Um, when you unleash something onto the internet and anyone at scale is using it, you got to be really cautious. So it's a different game. What have I observed looking at, looking at how people deal with that? I think we're still stepping stepping in the doo doo phase, honestly. Um, I mean, I just see it happening over and over again. Um, you know, things going horribly wrong, um, and I guess that's probably because it still pays off. We're the game out there is to be the first to do something, and there's a huge payoff for doing that. And so people are we're still in this era of just cowboy it, just like make something and put it out there and see, you know, what sticks. And then when it blows up too bad for you, but it was still worth the risk. And I think that's going to change. I think that's going to change. Uh, for one thing, like the number of new things seems to be decreasing over time. Like, I don't think people are that impressed by a, a chat bot on Twitter anymore. You know, They're like, okay, yeah, we've seen that. <laughs> So I think we're going to be moving into like practical stuff. Like, can can you solve problems? And the nature of solving practical, narrow problems, I've I've noticed is that it forces you to be more cautious just for good engineering. You know, so we're going to see less and less of interfaces where there's just a raw language model willing to say anything because that it's just, there aren't that many problems that require that. It's going to get more and more narrow and I think that, you know, the things that are left where it's still dangerous, um, yeah, we're going to have to figure out how to do it. And to your point, like, I think we are still essentially filtering. I think that is the best tool we have right now is to just make big exclude lists of terms and um, keep on adding to it. I've done that myself, I, you know, not not for toxicity, but... I mean, we were building a system once and um, uh, it wasn't dealing very well with uh, certain famous people uh, that, you know, would just pollute your data. And so we would just exclude them because they weren't relevant. And so we'd just like clean up, clean up results that way. It's an old school trick. And I think we're still doing that. And I think that'll continue. Ultimately, though, uh, well, a lot of people think that the solution is to train better language models, make them more polite and, you know, helpful and cautious from the get go. Other people feel like that's too hard. Just train them on the raw world as it is and then do something downstream to clean up their output. I don't think that's been settled. You mentioned chatbots. Have you seen anything nope. there? I don't, no, what, no matter what you're going to say, the answer is nope. <laughs> I don't think chatbots have improved at all. <laughs> I mean, there you, you would think they would inherit some some improvement due to transformers and that whole thing, but they are more fluent in terms of the, you know, they're not, it's not word salad, but they still can't keep track of what you're talking about. They're still not, they still haven't achieved utility. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. I bet I, I've one thing I, I loved this year uh, was uh, AI dungeon. Uh Have you played with this game or at least heard about it? Um, I don't, I don't remember which. Do you remember, do you remember Zork? Yep. 
So it's just a text adventure game like Zork, but it's powered by like GPT two and three. Yeah, I think I remember this. So it's just, you know, it's a text adventure that you get to basically be the player and dungeon master simultaneously. <laughs> yep. And um, that would, I think that's a glimpse at what the really cool hello world of tomorrow's chatbots is going to be. I think that's that, that kind of like, you're not trying to solve a problem that, you know, you're stressed about and money's on the line. It's going to start with games, something fun. Uh, where it's a little more free form and it can be kooky and it's okay. And uh, I think that's where the first really sophisticated chatbots are probably going to get used. I don't think it's going to be customer service. Everyone thinks it's going to be chatbots, you know, helping you with questions, you know, that you have of a company or your phone company or something like that. You can solve those kind of problems with much simpler systems because you don't need just to have a conversation with those bots. It's really just a fancy menu. Um, But with games you really do want to have a conversation and so something that really bugs me is like they haven't figured out co-reference resolution which is if i'm talking about something and then i say what do you think about that that is a reference to something that we've talked about earlier you have it in memory you know what it is these these models really struggle with co-reference resolution and so someone's got to crack that code someone's got to figure out how to make a chatbot that keep track of things. One of the really cool papers that came out this year that was a really, truly innovative idea is something called scratch pads. It was a Google paper. And the idea is you let the model literally take notes as it processes stuff. So you can imagine, you know, they did it for um, mathematics. Their paper was all about having this model work on a mathematical problem and it could take notes. But the sparks flying in my head were like, oh, it's not going to stop there. Imagine you have a model that has to deal with a book length document or an hour long conversation. We can't fit all that stuff into a standard transformer attention window. It's just got this little keyhole that it looks at the world and it forgets everything as soon as you move that window. And so, you know, this might be a way forward. You sort of give it a space where it can keep notes of the most important things and keep referring to it as it goes. I've been thinking about trying some version of this for longer documents. That's the something I care about. In the chatbot world, maybe it'll be something like that, where you literally have a model that's keeping track of the most important information, erasing it and changing it as it goes so that it can remember what that is when you say that. Mm-hmm. We'll yeah, see. I've, I don't know. I've had some interesting conversations uh, on the general topic of fusing various types of memory with you know, modern deep learning models. And that seems to be one of the, well, A, there's a lot of activity and B, it seems to be high potential. And, you know, if we get that right, we open up a whole nother dimension of uh, performance. Yeah, absolutely. Because right now we live in the world of the attention window. It's, it's only, it's, it's only about 500 words. (laughs) It's really small. You know, imagine you had amnesia where you forgot you know, everything you read before 500 words ago. Yeah. Pretty tough. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've seen that movie and the solution was writing things on your hand. That's scratch pad. That's right? scratch That's pad. Scratch pad. <laughs> yep. Yep. We've reinvented Memento. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's going to be a paper called Memento. <laughs> Actually, there are. That's a strong prediction. Yeah. <laughs> That's a strong prediction. <laughs> I feel like there is one though. Uh, I'm going to have to look that up. It can be rebranded. I think it, it can, can be, be reappropriated. Re-branded for sure. For sure. Uh, you briefly mentioned um, multilingual results uh, this year. Yeah, that's something that the community has been uh, kind of advocating for, or elements in the community have been kind of advocating for uh, for a long time, kind of pushing NLP beyond English or, or English dominant. Um what were the highlights in that uh, in that domain? Well, so this year, um, Chinese has just completely blown up. Chinese NLP is just amazingly, amazingly rich now. Multiple models, uh, language models bigger than GPT-3, um, whole new um, dialogue type models that is like Chinese based. Um, so... There's just no doubt, like um, the the language that's um, um, going to be on par with English, if it isn't already, is Chinese. It's a huge investment. Um, and then a bunch of other languages are starting to play uh, catch up. 
Um, I noticed that a Korean version of Glue came out and a GPT-3 um, Korean model called Hyperclova. Um, a whole bunch of other um, languages are also playing catch up, mostly by utilizing English models and then kind of uh, doing tricks to make them multilingual. The most um, exciting thing in, in multilingual NLP was this result from Facebook, uh, Meta, yeah. um, where a multilingual model beat all the bilinguals. That's a, that's a paradigm change. But I think actually the thing that's going to have the bigger impact long-term potentially is this other thing also from Meta called XLSR. So this is really new and intriguing. The idea here is uh, forget about the written text. Let's just do language and audio the way humans learn it and use it. And um, besides opening up an unbelievably vast potential data source, you know, most human speech is actually audio. You know, we, we NLP has just been grounded in text because we can easily deal with it with the computers of today. But meaning we have uh, this is it's this is an interesting problem to kind of formulate. So if you you know, certainly the volume in terms of bits of audio data is going to be greater than written data. Right, but that's not relevant. Sufficient, but that's not relevant. Right. Are, are you saying that we have more recorded words in audio formats than in written formats? I'm making a slightly weaker claim, which which is that um, every human alive today who utters language in any form is mostly doing it with their with their throat, not not their typing, you know, fingers, and. Um, I'm not sure. That's a that's an interesting and different question. Is um, if we had to do this today, how much data do we actually have counted by words? Let's say, you know, written versus recorded. Probably written. If I had to guess, just the libraries, you know, accumulated. Um, but with all the listening devices we now have in our pocket, in our home, in our meetings that could be eclipsed very, very quickly. Yeah, but do we even know how to build models that are kind of channel characteristic agnostic? Well, so that's that's the exciting promise here. It's like, maybe. Um, but I think that the, uh, well, the thing that excites me about it is um, this unlocks low resource languages in a way that we never could with written text. You just don't have enough written text from all of the African languages and all of the Aboriginal languages of South America and even a bunch of European languages. Uh, I hear Icelandic has this problem. There just isn't enough written text to train a language model the way we do today. But you could easily get a whole bunch of recording. And so that's pretty exciting. That that might be longer term, the bigger deal. We'll Very see. Cool. Very cool. The multilingual model that you referred to, um, I think it was meta. Yeah. Um, they did English to many and many to English was the paradigm. So, yeah. And by the way, they used the, this nice, efficient, new distributed mixture of experts architecture to pull it off, which is great. Nice. But nice. yeah, it was English to many and many to English. So there's still English at the heart of this effort. You know, it's, it's like the, it's the node connecting all the other languages data wise. Got it. Got it. Uh, so we've covered NLP eating the world. We've covered, uh, kind of this transition to incremental progress and of driving efficiency, multilingual benchmarks, uh, ethics, um, spicy and mild. And, and you've got this section here on some bad things that did not happen in 2021. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, people are always talking about, you know, the, the things that did happen. I think it's worth talking about the things that didn't happen, even though I expected them to. So one of those was, man, there was so much concern about GPT-3 generated text flooding the internet. I, I mean, I had to sweat it myself. I led a whole team working on this problem. For a whole year. Well, we had that concern about GPT-2 also. The mm -hmm. whole launch thing, oh, this is too powerful to share with anybody. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I've been looking real hard and I just don't see it happening yet. So we don't, we don't, Twitter doesn't. Could that be because it's so good that you can't detect it? Of course. Of course. Um, I don't think so though, because um, I can tell you as someone who's done this before, the first thing that'll happen is someone will uh, announce a prank. And I haven't even seen a large scale prank yet. 
I haven't seen anyone um, maintaining a, a well, you know, regarded or widely read blog that turns out to be all GPT text. I haven't seen a Twitter account that's had a big account, you know, a big impact on the world that turns out to be all generated. Nothing. It's just like a big whimper. And um, I think having used these models myself to solve problems with text generation, the reason I think is that they're just not that easy yet. It's not the case that you can command an army to generate, you know, things that are actually going to achieve some goal. It's, just, it's still too weird, too much hallucination, too much fuss. But I do think um, that troll farms, state-sponsored troll farms, and they, they continue to toil away, trust me. Um, I, if they aren't already, they will soon be using you know, GPT-style models to accelerate the human effort. And so, you know, there are going to be uh, efforts. I'm part of, you know, at Primer, I'm part of one of surely many such efforts to try and make detection systems to combat these. But that that will be a problem. But it didn't seem to happen this year. I, I just, I didn't see any evidence that uh, any bad actors were using these text generation models uh, at scale. So that's nice. Didn't see that. The other thing that didn't happen was uh, reinforcement learning didn't take over uh, NLP. A lot of people thought it was uh, inevitable because RL is just so amazingly impactful in other fields. It just didn't make any inroads. Um, there was one exception that I noticed, which was this um, open AI paper, uh, which was using reinforcement learning to shape um, a summarization model to human preferences. Neat. I mean, the, the results weren't like mind blowing, but worked um but it, yeah it hasn't hasn't rl is not eating ml <laughs> that's not happening yet um the other big surprise of course is that we still don't know how language models work still a big mystery we're still in in this era of uh you know treating these things like cells that you have to do experiments on to figure out how they what they can do and how they do it you know one of the things that we We've talked about language models, of course, throughout this conversation, um, and we've mentioned OpenAI specifically. We haven't specifically uh, talked about GPT-3 and all the things that um, have happened just in that world. Uh, do you think maybe a place to start is, do you, do you think it's worthy of um, talking about, do you think GPT-3 will have an outsized impact relative to the innovation that is large language models, or is it just, you know, a hosted example of which, you know, there are many. That is the million dollar question. I, <laughs> it, it is crazy how, how big the gap is between the excitement about these large autoaggressive language models like GPT-3 and the paucity of applications unbelievable divide there. And when you say the paucity of applications, do you mean the, you know, in fact, actual, you know, in the wild applications or the paucity of use cases for which they could be kind of reliably applied? Well, I think they're they related. The I yeah. think that you put your finger right on the problem. Uh, I think of GPT-3 and, and its many cousins as wild horses. Mm -hmm. It's clearly an awesome horse. Uh, really powerful, um, but good luck riding that thing to get like to town. Um, they're just very hard at this point to control, to do you know, the things you need um, for most tasks. And trust me, we, we're trying like others to use them to try and make progress on the problems you know we care about. Um, you're usually better off with a smaller, simpler model. Just uh, training data is more important than parameter size for um, the narrow, practical, applied ML problems of today. That could change, though. Um, one way we tried to use, um, we haven't been using GPT-3, uh, but GPT-NEO, uh, the 16 um, billion parameter one, or uh, 6 billion. Yeah, it's called GPT-J 6B. Um, so that's the biggest that was open source from Eleuther. We've been trying to use it for data augmentation. So we were like, okay, well, if you can't put this model literally into production to do a task, 
maybe you can use it as a tool to train a simpler model more efficiently. So we've been trying to find all kinds of ways to get it to, you know, teach another model to do cool things. Can't even get it to do that yet. I have to admit, we just have not cracked the code on that. What you can do with it is all kinds of fun stunts. Um, so, <laughs> I mean, it, it's just irresistibly fun to engineer a prompt to do some brand new trick all in the space of 10, 20 minutes. You know, where else in ML can you can you do that? I've used it to generate um, new neologisms, urban dictionary style neologisms, where you give it a description of a word you wish existed and it just spits out a weird word. Fun. I've used it to um, generate movie plots or movie names given a plot. Um, I just made a, a prompt from stuff I copy pasted from Amazon Prime. Super easy. Um, and I've recently used it to generate um, what I call deep talk questions. So this is a real practical use case. So COVID came and we were all like a bunch of people who used to work in an office and breathe the same air and feel connected. And, you know, it's it's very hard to stay connected when you just, you know, everyone's a little tiny face on a, in a grid. And so um, I have this Monday ritual with my team now that... We start with deep questions. We used to use a uh, um, a list that was floating around the internet of a bunch of deep questions. You know, stuff like, um, "What is something you regret from your childhood? What is what is um, you know what, who was the most influential person in your life? Uh, if you could go back in time and change one thing, what would it be?" You know, these kind of questions they elicit real conversation. And uh, we blew through that list because we were doing it every week and, and we would um, randomly choose three and then vote on one. So we got exposed to all the questions pretty fast. So what I did was I just made a prompt of actual deep questions and used GPT Neo to just generate tons of these things. And uh, awesome. I put it on the internet. It's like taking a life of its own. It's on the internet now. But like, yeah, you can use them for yeah. certain things, but um, no one's figured out how to tame that horse. Do you follow and and have you played with the various kind of incremental things that OpenAI has done with the API, like the instruct engine? I think technically it's not 2021. It was actually a year ago from the recording of this conversation. That I, I haven't, um, but only because um, I'm so busy using GPT-NEO and trying to trying to figure out how to make it useful. <laughs> so I I have access to GPT three have for a long time, but uh, I didn't find myself using because uh, every trick that GPT three could do, I could do myself with an open source model. Um, but for all I know, that they've improved it by leaps and bounds. I just wouldn't know. Yeah, the instruct uh, instruct model allows you to um, kind of by, by, bypass a lot of the prompt creation and just say in natural language what you want the model to create um that's kind of interesting and they've got um you know fine tuning and specific uh ways to use it for classification and question answering and other things um the idea being to make it you know easier and more accessible and to try to reduce the need to be a prompt engineering ninja yeah get something done Oh, well, I'll, I'll give it a, I'll give it another try. Um, yeah. I mean, open AI is doing such wonderful things. That I, I wouldn't be surprised if they've made some really cool advances on that front too. Um, one thing that we have been using that I think should go in the list of most successful um, applied ML NLP, um, you know, most, most successful examples of actual day-to-day -day useful NLP is Copilot. I know it's gotten a lot of, you know, complaints, especially about copyright, but people on my team actually use it. It's like, if you know what you're doing and you understand its limitations, it's pretty wonderful. It, it takes, it takes a lot of dreary, you know, boilerplate code writing out of your life. You know, you, you switch to a mode of taking a template that's generated by the model and making sure it's correct in a lot of cases. And that is like 10 times faster than writing that boilerplate yourself. Yeah. And how are they using it? Is there a... In VS Code. In VS Code? Yep. Okay. Yeah. 
I don't, I haven't done it myself, but uh, it's top of my to-do list now to try it. Um, Cause I, I only discovered this past week that um, they were using it. I was like, Oh wow. So it's gotten to the point where it's actually useful. All right, I'm going to check it out. Yeah. I haven't checked in a while, but the thing that I was most looking for was like some kind of Jupyter notebook plugin. Um, I think it's through VS code because you can imagine you have to make these API calls. Yeah. It's, there's a lot of guts that have to be kind of set up for that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I, it's, you know, that's one that I can relate to um, quite a bit, just that, you know, I'm not a professional engineer, data scientist, whatever day to day, I forget, you know, what's the specific format for doing such and such in Python or Pandas or whatever. And you do what anyone does, which is you go to Stack Overflow, you, f- you find some exactly. version of the problem, <laughs> and then you have to copy paste and then change it because that's actually not quite the problem I was solving. Right. The- Copilot is just doing exactly that, but yeah. as a neural network, it's, it's already got all of GitHub. Exactly. <laughs> and so it just, it just, uh, it knows how to like spit out boilerplate. Yeah. So I'm going to, I'm definitely going to have to go look at that plugin. I had not played with it yet. Uh, if anyone knows about a way to do that inside of Jupyter, uh, let me know. That would be a really uh, cool, um, little gadget. If, if someone in the open source Jupyter community would make that, that would be really cool. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, so also on your list of fun things that did happen in 2021, My Little Pony GPT. What is that? I think I missed that one. <laughs> yeah. So um, I think like of the things that happened this year um, that I noticed and remembered were the delightful things. Um, and so one of the delightful things was someone, you know, of course, someone did this. They, they basically trained a language model on My Little Pony text. So that, you know, it speaks in the language of this kid's toy universe. Um, And uh, I think we're just going to see a lot more of that playfulness uh, before people start cashing in and figuring out how to make industrial scale text generation, um, which is coming. But I think it's going to be the artists and pranksters uh, who are going to lead the way. And you see that already with Clip and and these things. Uh, it's, It's play. Play is leading the way, which is cool. That's great. That's great. I think we've talked about a lot of your predictions uh, already. Are there ones that we've not mentioned yet? Let me see. I made myself a little list. One thing we didn't mention is that I think that um, we're going to have the emergence of AI first gaming companies. So AI Dungeon, I think, can claim the mantle of being the first that I, that I know of. Um, but there's going to be many. AI first gaming companies, and they're going to be taking advantage of this concept of an infinite game, you know, where NPCs are actual agents that evolve and can, you can talk to, and the world itself is evolving in, in response to your decisions, um, not just through procedural generation, but more sophisticated things. So that's going to be really fun. While you're describing this, I'm looking for this interesting company that uh, a friend just told me about transforms.ai have you heard of that they uh they're kind of you know thirty thousand foot bolting language models onto ar vr as kind of a metaverse gaming play interesting stuff huh cool well it looks like a lot of this stuff's already arriving then great (laughs) yeah that's gonna be fun um the other thing is um there are a bunch of very narrow application uh, AI startups in the NLP space um, that are only going to get better, like Grammarly. Um, I think of as expense. I think Expensify is kind of an NLP startup, even though it's a mixture of computer vision and like NLP. OCR kind of, mm-hmm. yeah. But they're just so good. I use them all the time, and it's like a beautiful example of narrow but really nailed it applications. And I think all of those very narrow startups are going to get better at what they're doing, but they're going to start to expand inevitably. Like you're only just a a walk away from this neighborhood and you can kind of support that workflow. And I think uh, they're going to get acquired real fast. And um, those that remain are going to be contenders. It'll take more than a year, but the ones that don't get um, acquired and stick around and keep expanding are going to be new fan companies eventually. And that'll be cool to see. Let's find out. Um, let's see, the fan companies are going to be very, very cautious about 
anything involving a language model because of PR uh, and, and rightly so. Um, but I do think they're going to be putting more and more AI, mu AI muscle behind their existing features. It'll be invisible progress. You won't realize it, but more and more of the stuff you take for granted will be um, taking advantage of AI. Um, and then I guess the other thing that I haven't mentioned is um, we're not going to stop at um, language to image, you know, clip and glide and dolly. That's just the first shot across the bow. Um, I think all the, all the rich multimodality will start to get eaten up. I just can't wait for movement to be part of it. So, you know, like, first of all, of course, you'll have videos where you can, you can say what you want, you know, uh, a boy walking down the street, you know, right now you get an image of a boy walking down the street. Next step, of course, is to get a little video clip, a little animation of a boy walking down the street. But um, where it gets interesting is where it gets really rich, where you could just write a little scene, a little movie plot, and it'll just make that coherently. I can't wait for that. And then also some really weird stuff like mecha a mechanical hand, you know, the data coming in and out of this, you know, electronic gadget is just data. And so you can imagine, you know, like essentially doing the trick that computer vision has been using with, um, you know, text as a kind of data, a uh, brand new data paradigm with robotics. I don't, I don't see why it, it, NLP won't start to eat robotics where you, you know, rather than just having kinematics where you have to like do all the vector math to figure out how to pick up something, you know, or use reinforcement learning to somehow train it to do this. I think language will somehow come into the mix sooner or later. I don't know if that'll be this year, but it feels inevitable. Language is just so good for encapsulating information um, at the highest level about the goals that we care about. That, the thought that that prompted me was, um, do, you, do you see or anticipate a role for artificial language? Uh, like, you know, will we, will, is what's happening in NLP going to enable like lay people DSLs that allow us to accomplish tasks better? It's kind of oh. a half form thought, but, <laughs> um, do you mean like you could say, do my taxes and you don't have to be more technical than that? Yeah, I'm not sure what I mean. Um, I thought you were going someplace even weirder. You know um, what? I, you know, maybe one thing in the back of my head is like really, really early on in the, this is probably like five or six years ago. Um, like there was some crazy article about, hey, Facebook had these two chatbots talking yes. to them and they invented that's, their own language. Yeah, that's what I thought uh, you were talking about. For transacting. Yeah. And, you know, I've always kind of remembered that plus, um, you know, one, a cool concept uh, on, in engineering, computer science, you know, to me has always been like the DSL, like, you know, you can write code to do something, you can configure an engine to do something, or you can create a language that allows someone to do the task at a higher level of abstraction than code. Uh, and in a more kind of meaningful and fluid and visualizable and understandable way than configuration. And so, and I find myself like, you know, just everyday productivity trying to kind of put together, um, you know, using tools like Alfred on the Mac, like, you know, how can I put together a bunch of like three letter things that will do some task for me? Um, you're just, just wondering, you're talking about compression. But, kind but, of, yeah. but, but I think there's, you're, you're hinting at something even cooler, which is making thoughts possible that aren't yet possible. So, you know, this is old theory and linguistics. That. Yeah. That, you know, like thought is truly composed of language. And if you don't have the language for it, you truly can't think it. I don't know if that's true or not, but I do know that practically it's very difficult to do the mental gymnastics for certain things without the vocabulary and the kind of you know, st linguistic structures that support that. And um, I think what it comes down to, if you're, if you're talking about machine learning is, do you need a human in the loop? So, you know, the, the example of two machines talking to each other, evolving their own language. I mean, imagine you took the data set 
of a whole bunch of audio and a whole bunch of um, good transcription of that audio. So you've got speech and you've got text. I've been thinking about this quirky, pointless experiment where you could then take that system that's been trained on that. And then, in fact, let's, let's just do English. You've got a ton of English uh, recording and the transcription. You got a model that's good at that. And now you give it a, a language it's never heard. It'll try and write it in English with English phonemes, you know, and it'll make a, a sort of like anglicized version, I imagine, of that language, right? <laughs> so, you know, why stop there? Imagine like going from, um, let's say, mathematical descriptions to formulas, you know, like English to math, or maybe from, so between any two domains, and you just, you basically have a grounding uh, vocabulary and you have a system discover a brand new language for some new domain. What's the utility of that? I couldn't tell you, but <laughs> I think it would be hilarious. <laughs> the, the thing that it made me think of, you may have seen this video a few years ago. It's like what English sounds like to non-English speakers yes. on YouTube. Yes. You remember that? Yes, <laughs> exactly. So, um, you know, do you need a human in a loop? Not necessarily, um, but I think we should care about that more than you know, anything else. So, you know, how can we, I, I had a really simple, simple idea I implemented once. This is not ML. This is old school NLP. Um, I made this, this uh, algorithm that detected jargon and spe specifically abbreviated jargon, which the scientific papers I was reading was just so full of. And I was trying to learn new fields and you get all these big acronyms and you have no idea. So I just wrote an algorithm that would find all those things and find their expanded forms, usually regular expressions. It was nothing fancy. And it occurred to me that you could use uh, the opposite of this to invent new jargon that text seemed to need because phrases seem to be just used over and over again. So you could just invent an, ac an algorithm, uh, invent an acronym, you know, an abbreviation that you didn't realize you needed. <laughs> and you could, you know, even invent, if you want to get machine learning involved, you could define it. You could have something that will generate definitions of these things and just make a glossary of invented jargon. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think the last few minutes of this conversation kind of illustrates the, the delight aspect of, uh, NLP and eh, to some degree machine learning. Absolutely. Learning NLP, as well NLP is about. finally fun. I'd say it was not fun in 2017 and before it was hard. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like now it's just fun. That's awesome. Well, that sounds like a great way to finish up uh, this year's AI Rewind. John, it's so great reconnecting and talking through what you've seen this year and, and what you expect to see looking forward. Happy holidays and looking forward to 2022. Absolutely. Happy holidays. Thank you. <laughs>